Hi, my name is Mike Holt with MikeHolt.com, and this is the second program uh, in a row covering your code questions. So, some basic rules. We're covering only code-related questions. I believe there might be something else, but mostly just simply NAFTA to code questions. I'm going to be using the 2020 National Electrical Code, and I'll, I'll dance back into the 2017 if I can remember what the 17 was in case it was a change. But I think we're going to be okay because we're covering fundamental rules. The purpose of the NEC we discussed yesterday is to make sure it's a safe installation. Your job that's watch this video, whether you're a contractor, electrician, an apprentice, an instructor, a student, an engineer, wherever you fit within this industry, your job is to make sure that the installations are going to be safe. So the authority having jurisdiction 90.4 we talked about yesterday, sometimes it's going to have to make some judgment calls. And as we go along, I might kind of pull a 90.4 and say, guys, this is what I think I need to do. All right, Brian, why don't you go ahead and uh, get my slides up. Let me know when they're up there. And then uh, let's start rocking. Okay, first thing I'd like to do is just take a moment to thank God. Um, we're all been blessed. And I've been blessed. And I've worked hard, I understand, but still I've been blessed. So I hope to carry myself in a way that's going to be honorable, it's not going to be disrespectful, because my tendency is I'm an arrogant, condescending, impatient kind of guy. So I have to work on that every single day. All right. First thing, question came up is backstab, or what's also called push-in conductor connections. The question is this. Backstab receptacles have a hot, it's a statement that somebody said, hey, Mike, backstab receptacles have a high failure rate. Why are they still permitted by the NEC? I don't know that they have a high failure rate. And maybe you guys that are doing service work say, Mike, you haven't been out in the field long enough to know that there's a high failure rate. Um, they're a listed product to be installed in accordance with the listing itself. And they're listed for a solid conductor, 14 gauge. Years ago, they were permitted to be used with a 12 gauge wire solid conductor. And there was problems with those push-in receptacles, push-in connectors, or what we sometimes call backstab receptacles. So it's 14 gauge wire. Here's an example, looking at a receptacle. I'm, I'm using 406.5, um, but we're not talking about that rule. It ha that rule has to do with attaching a box, uh, I mean a receptacle to a box or a cover, and you have to use the screws that are designed for that, 632s. The point I wanna make right here is just that this receptacle is a backstab, and you notice it's going to be Romex. If you're running conduit, it's highly unlikely that you're running a solid conductor. You're probably gonna be running THHN stranded conductor. So therefore, if you're running stranded conductors, you're pulling single conductors, you're never gonna be able to backstab a receptacle, nor can you backstab a switch. You're running 14 gauge Romex. So basically we're talking about the limitations are backstabbing receptacles and switches on 14 gauge wire, which would be probably a dwelling unit. You still can use Romex in commercial buildings. My office is wired in Romex. I mean, why would I run anything more than that? But I have to comply with the requirements in 334. So it's kind of limited. And in a dwelling unit, don't have a lot of loads on there. So I'm not aware of there being a problem with backstabbing. I have heard, I don't know if I believe it. Actually, I don't believe it. Well, my. It's a backstabbing of receptacles that are causing AFCIs to trip. I'm sure that's not true. Now, I am gonna talk about AFCIs tripping. Not today, but that is something I'll be discussing over the time, and I have lots of experience on AFCI tripping, and I have the answer in how you get that solved. So hang on with me in the next few weeks, and next few nights, and the next few days, and the next few hours. Okay, the next question has to do with supporting of lay-in fixtures. And the email came in and said, hey, Mike, what's the NEC requirements for the supporting of lay-in fixtures? You know, my building official says this, or other people say this and that. So let's just cover the code rules. And that's 410.36B. And here's what it says. Luminaires must be securely fastened to the ceiling framing members by screws, bolts, rivets, or clips listed and identified for such use. Now, I haven't installed a lay-in fixture in a long time. 
And we didn't have any kind of clips. My, my understanding now, the laying fixtures themselves, when you buy them, you put it into the ceiling, and then there's mechanisms or there's, there's, there's a means, part of the fixture itself, that will connect it to the ceiling grid. That's it. That's the Nash Electric Code. Now, the next slide is a comment slide. As you can see, these are all graphics out of my understanding, the Nash Electric Code book. And sometimes I'll have a comment. It's not a code rule. So 410.36b, my comment to that, and I have an author's comment in the book about this, it says the NEC doesn't require independent support wires for a suspended ceiling luminaire installed in a suspended ceiling that is, isn't fire rated. Now, when you get into a fire rated suspended ceiling, that's not the Nash Electric Code, that's the building code. And when you get into fire rated ceilings, there is going to be a detailed drawing or part in those blueprints, and it will specifically identify that those fixtures are going to have to be supported in a specific manner. Sometimes the building code will cover that. Uh, those of you that are in California, I don't know, where do we have seismic areas in the country? Um, we all know California, Washington, Oregon, um, but there's other places, surprisingly, that there is a seismic code. So where there is a, an earthquake area, then they have a seismic requirements and they will require the independent support of the fixtures. Take a look at the graphic here. If you have to independently support the fixtures, you'll have to look at the details and how he's supposed to do it. You can't have an inspector come out there and just simply tell you, hey, I want you to independently support the wires. And that's 90.4, given the authority to have a jurisdiction to, to interpret the rule, doesn't give them the power to do what they want to. Okay, so that's, I'm talking about, they would have to give you a requirement. Here, here's the building code. Here's the blueprints. Here's the, no, they're gonna have to show you something that says that you have to independently support those fixtures. So, National Electric Code, you support it directly to the ceiling grid. Uh, let's go back to that graphic. By screws, bolts, rivets, clips, identified, listed and identified for such use. In other words, that's part of the fixture itself. Now, I'm going quickly, I'm, I, I'm trying to be complete, but if you have any questions, it's really important that you go to mycolt.com slash live, register, and then I, I think there's a feature in there about down at the bottom somewhere, Brian, make sure it's clear if it's not clear, about being able to make a comment. If you can make those comments in that feature, not in YouTube, not in Facebook, not in Instagram, but mycolt.com slash live, we will capture those real time, and then I can go ahead and respond to those as we go along. Now, here's my plan for tonight. I'm changing a little bit. We're going to go 45 minutes, which means at 7, well, your time, whatever your time is, my time is 7 o'clock. So at 7.45, um, we're going to take a five-minute break. And that gives us a chance to kind of collect maybe the comments that you made on mycolt.com slash live. Then when we get back, I'm going to do a review of those comments that came in. And if there's any remaining time after that, I'm sure I'm going to run late because I've never let a class out of my life early ever. And it's not going to happen tonight either. You guys can jump out wherever you want to jump out. So go to mycolt.com slash live. Okay. Next question has to do with transformer secondary conductors. Here's the question, Mike. The maximum secondary conductor length from a transformer is, in one rule, 10 feet, and in another rule, 25 feet. Can you explain the differences between the 10-foot and the 25-foot secondary tap rule? And why is there limited 25 feet? Now, in this form that we're working on right now, this is not a class that I'm teaching all day long. This is not a DVD that we have all kinds of experts on a panel and that we can explore all these things. It's for me to give you an introduction to the rules, for me to be able to help you get an insight, but the details, this is not where it's going to go, but I'll do the best I possibly can. Okay, number one, secondary conductors are not tap conductors. You go to 240.21c, which covers the rules on secondary conductors. 24021B covers the rules on feeder tap rules. So B covers tap conductors, C covers secondary conductors. Not a big deal. 
But I'd like you to understand it's not a tap conductor, it's a secondary conductor, and there's a specific rule, 24021C. So now, let's see if I get some graphics to show you here. Okay, the first one here is 24021C21, which is just a general conversation about secondary conductors. And let's read, this is not over 10 feet. Number one, the conductor must have an impassage sufficient for the load, right? I mean, okay. How do you do the load? Well, you just do a load calculation and then you come up with, hey, I, I need to have wires on the secondary to have this much amp. It kind of works the other way. You kind of have to know what your load is. And once you know what your load is, then you size your transformer. Then once you know what your transformer is, then you're going to size the conductors. Okay? So, but number one, no less than the rating of the load. And then B, no less than the rating of the equipment containing overcurrent devices or the rating of the overcurrent protection device where the secondary conductor terminate. Now, what that is saying is this. Your secondary conductors, they are required to terminate. I'm going to say it this way, I'm going to, and, I'm going to, and I'm going to go backwards on it. They are required to terminate in an overcurrent device. Now, what's an overcurrent device? Well, Article 100 now, gives you the definition of an overcurrent device. And for all practical purposes, in the electrical trade, as we're working with the NEC, it's a circuit breaker or it's a fuse. Well, Mike, if the code requires you to terminate into an overcurrent device, I can see you can terminate into a breaker, but you can't terminate to a fuse. Okay, fine. All right, so the code doesn't say you have to terminate to an overcurrent device. Let's read the rule again, B. It says that the conductors must have a rating of the equipment containing over, the rating of the equipment containing overcurrent devices. Oh, the fusible disconnect. So your secondary conductors have to be able to carry the load. And if you terminate into a fusible disconnect, then the impassive conductors cannot be less than the rating of the disconnecting means. Now go on, watch out. Or the rating of the overcurrent device. Oh, well then if you terminate in the breaker, here's an example. Um, you have a 100 amp fusible disconnect and you put 70 amp fuses. What's the minimum opacity of those conductors? Well, it's terminating in equipment that's rated 100 amps. Then you need what? You need a 100 amp wire. But what if you terminate in a circuit breaker, maybe like back feed a circuit breaker or terminate right in a circuit breaker? Well, then if you're gonna have a 70 amp circuit breaker, you only need 70 amp wire. Does that make sense? Because if you go into an enclosure that's rated 100 amps, the fact that you put 70 amp fuses in there doesn't mean you might not put something bigger. But if you go right to an overcurrent device, like a circuit breaker, then you size it to the rating of that device. And by the way, in case I don't see it in here because of a lot of things, something to be aware of. Secondary conductors on the 10 foot tap rule, strange enough, must be in a raceway. You're like, okay, well, what's that big of a deal? Well. I would run MC cable, given an opportunity, rather than putting in a raceway and then pulling in single conductors. Well, the problem is that if you're running MC cable, which is a very reasonable, practical wiring method, um, you can't do it on a 10-foot tap rule. So you'd have to have those conductors longer than 10 feet. But then the 25, I said the word tap. Ugh. Okay, they can't, if, if, they're, if they're not more than 10 feet secondary conductor length, then it's going to have to be in a raceway if the secondary conductor length is more than 10 feet but not more than 25 feet then you can use an mc cable also while we're looking at this graphic here you don't have to have liquid tight or flex wire method you could run rigid metal conduit to the primary and you can run rigid metal conduit to secondary well mike what about the vibration there's no vibration on that enclosure Look inside the transformer. The transformer is vibrating, not the enclosure. And the transformer is sitting on, on some rubber, uh, what do you call those things? You know, rubber things, and they are vibrating. How much vibrating are really doing? Vibration isolators, Brian House just told me. I love that, Brian, That's, that works out perfect for me. Okay, vibration isolators, okay? So if you wanna run Rigid metal conduit or ENT or any raceway directly to it, fine. If you want flexible because it's, it's easy for you to do it, which kind of makes sense. It's only a short little run anyhow. So, takes care of that rule. What else we got here? Okay. 
Now, how do you size the conductors on the primary and the primary protection and the secondary conductors and the secondary protection and all those details? You ready for this? Right there. Stop right now. Pick up your phone. Go to any of your app stores, whether it be an iPhone or, or an Android, and look for Mike Holt Electrical Toolbox. Click on it. Install it free and do this transformer calculation. We have what? A 75 kVA transformer. It is the coolest app. It's free. That's what's even cooler. But trust me, when I do something, I do it first class. If you take a look at the app and you look at the results, you'll see that I have all kinds of code rules explaining every single calculation. I'm not going to give you an app. You put some basic information in there and then it just tells you the answer without giving you the support documentation. It is an amazing tool for students to check your instructors because it has a lot of different calculations in there. It's an amazing tool for instructors to be able to work with the students in the class, teach them how to use technology, electrical inspectors, uh, then double checking the plants, making sure that that wire is right. You know, you got 125, 112.5 kVA transfer, boom, boom, done, finished. Takes I don't know, less than a minute to do a transfer calculation. So I'm not going to do the manual, manual calculation here. Take the app, print it out. It gives you all the code rules, gives you all the information. Or you know what you might want to do is simply get my book. I have a book on electrical calculations. It's in the exam prep for you to understand the details. All right, look at 240, 21C, and read all the rules in there. So now the difference between a 10 foot and a 25 foot tap rule for all practical purpose, is that the 10 foot rule requires a raceway. The 25 doesn't. I'm not gonna get into the details of why there's a 10 and why there's a 25. Why is it in like a 8.7 and a 37.2? It's what it is. This is not the vehicle for me to explain that. But I do explain that when I actually in the, the recordings that I do in my bonding and grounding book, as well as my understanding NEC. That's all I can do on that one. Get a, go to download the app. It's very cool. It's free. And let me know how you think about that app. All right, next one. Why can't we size the conductors at 90 degrees C? When I was an electrician, we used what was called TW and THW. TW is solid. We ran all solid conductors or branch circuits uh, for 14 and 12. Uh, was rated 60 degrees C. And then we used THW, which would have been more for the feeders and the service conductors, and they're rated 75 degrees C. Then all of a sudden, this wire came out and it was THHN, we're like, what the heck is this? And if you look at the code book, you look at the table of impacity, the impassive eight gauge THHN is 50 amps. We were running six gauge wire for ranges. And all of a sudden now we ran it, we started running eight gauge wire because we found out it was rated 50, I think it's 55 amps, it's eight gauge wire. I think it's maybe 50 amps. And then we found out you can't be using eight gauge wire rated 50, what's it, uh, rated something, 50 something amps at 90 degrees C. There's a rule, we can't get into the rule. 110.14C1 says this in general, just real quick general. It says, listen, 100 amp rated equipment in terminals and less, the wires were designed to be sized using the 60 degree C column ampacity of table 31015B16 in the 17 code and table 31016 and the 20 code. And then if you go a little further in 11014C1B, it says that, well, okay, if it's over 100 amperes, then the, then the equipment is designed to have the conductor size to the 75 degree C column of table 31015B16 and the 17 in prior codes and table 31016 in the 20 code. Nothing in there talking about 90 degrees C. So the reason we can't use 90 degrees C for size of conductors is because this rule, 110.14C1, this rule has to do with sizing the conductors to terminals, having to terminals, just to terminals. And it's, so you have terminals in there. And those terminals were designed to be 60 degrees C conductor sizing, 100 amps or less or to design to be 75 degrees C conductor sizing if it's over 100 amperes. Now, in reality though, pretty much all terminals 
I rate it 75 degrees C. So as I kind of go along this program, I'm going to be sizing the conductors to the 75 degree C column, except when you run Romex or non-metallic sheath cable. I'm not going to get the reasons why there, but non-metallic sheath cable has a requirement saying that you, even though the, see, if, I don't know if you know this, Romex, if you take the insulation off, sometimes you'll see the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the jacket off, you'll see the conductors within. And the code identifies it also. They have to be 90 degrees C wire. So the conductors inside the jacket of Romex are 90 degrees C. But the code says, we don't care where the terminals are. You're going to size the conductors to 60 degrees C. So let me set some ground rules then. I'm going to assume all terminals are rated 75 degrees C, regardless of the ampacity. But when it comes to Romex, I'm going to assume we're going to size the conductors to the 60 degrees C as required in 310. I'm sorry, as required in 334.80. So let's go back to the question. Section, he says, Mike, section 11014C1 relates to sizing conductors in accordance temperature terminal limitations. Why can't we use the 90 degree C column of table 310.16 when sizing the wires? Because the equipment was designed to be sized based upon the rating from the manufacturer. It was never designed to have 90 degree C wire operating at 90 degree C heat. I don't know what 90 degree C heat, heat is, but you can go to table 31016 and 90 degree C is somewhere like 194, de 194 degrees or something like that. Let's see if I get to it real quick. Should have had a tab on my code book. I know that's what you get. If you had a tab, Mike, you'd be there right now. Okay, that's true. Okay. So, okay, 90 degrees C is 194 degrees Fahrenheit. No piece of equipment that has an overcurrent device is going to be rated for that. Now, they do make other applications, and that's covered in my books, but it's not here right now. So, again, any feedback, go to mycolt.com, put feedback, and then we're going to take a break here at, at, at the at time at 45 minutes, you know, different time zones here. Take a five-minute break. Give us time to collect that and then come back and spend, I'm sure, more than 15 minutes when we get back. All right, let's look at the graphic here. So, if it's 100 amps or less, all terminals are rated for 60 degrees C unless marked. Look at a range receptacle. You'll see. It, it'll be on there, 75 degrees C. So, equipment, the equipment, it's not, it's not the terminal ratings. It's the equipment rating. You, you can get a 90 degree C lug. But if you put it on a 200 amp panel, that equipment is only rated for 75 degrees C. It's never rated for more than that when it comes to that application. Again, a little bit more complicated than I can get into right now. Okay, so 100 amps or less has to be rated 60 degrees C unless marked. I looked at this particular receptacle right here. I'll, Brian, make a note for us to maybe show that receptacle in a detail so somebody can see that there actually is a 75 degrees C marking on that receptacle. If that's the case, that I don't size a conductor to 60 degrees C. I go up to table 310.16. I'm only going to use that reference now. And that would be an 8 gauge wire that is rated for 50 amps at 75 degrees C. I can never size a conductor to the 90 degrees C column. All right. And now here, continuing on 11014C1B, B is when it goes. Over 100 amp years, all terminals are rated for 75 degrees C. So really what you need to do is this. Go to your code book. And if I have my tab, I find it quicker, so I guess I know what I'm doing. Hey, Brian, have the office send me a set of tabs. I don't normally use a code book. I usually use an electronic version of the code, but we're not going to talk about the 2020 electronic version of the code. Okay. What you might want to do is take your code book. If you have a code book, you're in class. The 90 degree C column is going to be used when you're using calculations for ampacity. The 60 and 75 degree C column is only used when you're going to size the conductors. So if you have 60 degree C terminals, then you go to 60 degree C columns. But in reality, everything is 75 degree C. So guess what? Forget the 60 degree C column, unless you're taking a test. You go over to the 75 degree C column, and that's how you'd answer all your questions in the real world. Because that's what they are. The 75 degrees C under 100 amps, 75 degrees C above 100 amperes. Okay, guess what? A lot of this stuff you don't even have to do. 
All you gotta do is get the Michael electrical toolbox, put your circuit in there. We automatically calculate that. And we'll tell you automatically, hey, this is the size wire you can run if it's gonna be uh, conductors. And if you're running Romex, this is the size wire. So there could be at times a difference in wire size. See, the Romex might be a little larger because we have to size at a 60 degree C, even if the equipment is rated 75 degree C. Okay, I'm gonna move on. What's the difference between bonding and grounding? It's like, what's the purpose of life, right? It's one of those philosophical things that it just goes on and on and on. Yeah, like, what do you have, a lifetime here? You know, on this live stream, you want us to take the next whatever number of weeks and months to explain it? Here's the answer. Go to mycolt.com, click on videos, go to bonding and grounding, and then go to the electrical safety fundamentals. Now the electrical safety fundamentals, you'll see there are seven parts. Please do not pick any one of these seven parts. Click the first link up here and it will play all seven parts. Then later on when you're really smart and you understand everything, and by the way, Watch that video three times. The first time you're gonna like, uh, second time like, you know, I'm thinking I understand. Third time is like, you almost have it. You have to understand something. Any questions you ask me anywhere in my lifetime or your life that have to do with grounding and bonding can't be answered if you don't understand physics. Now, this is all covered in our fundamentals class and our theory book and our videos and the DVDs and all that stuff. If you had all that done, then you're gonna be fine. But you still need to watch this again because there's a, in, in, in myquote.com, you see there'll be a link on videos, go to bonding and grounding, click the fundamentals. Let me give you some examples of some crazy things people are doing out there. People are driving ground rods at metal light poles. Are you uh, kidding me? People are engineers actually designing jobs showing a ground rod at a light pole. Are you kidding me? There are inspectors out there saying, hey, where's your ground rod at your light pole? Are you kidding me? The moment somebody tells you that you need a ground rod at a light pole, do not ask them ever again another question. Just say, okay, more than likely that guy hates aluminum wire. What else does he do? He hates GFCIs and there's some other things. This is a dinosaur. Hey, Brian, you know what I'd like to do? Maybe sometime, maybe tomorrow. I'd like to play that one video about, um, you know, change and how some people can change, some people don't. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, so tomorrow we're going to play a video that will help put this in perspective. Okay, so back to the question. What's the difference between bonding and grounding? 100%. That is answered by MikeHolt.com. Click on the videos, go to Bonnie Grounding, click on that first one, watch it three times. After you watch it three times, you're gonna realize, is everybody around me crazy? Yeah. What they think about bonding and grounding is not even close to being true. And then you do it, but that only is a small piece. I have a bonding and grounding book with, I don't know, three or four videos, it's massive. This is just the least to give you some fundamentals. Okay, Mike. Well, this has to do with the number of NM cables. An NM cable is the code. It's called type NM cable, non-metallic sheath cable, through framing members. We call it Romex, okay? How many Romex cables can you run through a framing member? Well, here's the question. Mike, I failed an inspection because the inspector said that we were limited to no more than four NM cables per openings, meaning you drill a hole or you had an opening in the metal studs. We had seven Romex cables, 12-2, doesn't matter what size wire, but he said it was 12-2, uh, going through one hole and a two by four wood stud. Like, what the heck's the deal? Okay, well, can't get into all the details because the 17 code has different rules, well, maybe, references than the 20 code, but it's right around, in the 17 code, it's 310, that 15, B or something like that. And then in the 20 code, oh, it's still a 310.15. It's, it's a 310.15, it'll be the number of conductors going inside there. I think 
It's, it's also a B. So they're real close to each other right there. And there's a table that tells you, and many of you already heard about this, but get your cookbook out, go look at that. You're right there, right before 310.16 or 310.15 B16, you'll see a table and it's gonna tell you one to three conductors, there is no adjustment, an impasse adjustment. The dinosaur guy, the one that hates aluminum wire, what was the other thing he hated? Um, oh yeah, he likes ground rods. He hates aluminum wire, he likes ground rods, he hates GFCIs, okay. That person would probably call it derating. Well, you have to derate that impasse. No, we don't derate any impasse. That was years ago. We don't say MCM, we don't say derate. This is called an opacity adjustment. And there's a table. One to three conductors, the adjustment is going to be 100%, which, which means a 20 amp wire is a 20 amp wire, a 30 amp wire is a 30 amp wire. And then it goes on to four to six conductors. You guys can get your cobalt out, take a look at that. Four to six conductors, it's going to be an 80% adjustment. Now, I don't have my code book open on my tab there. I could look at it real quick here. Um, six, Brian, you can double check me. Let's see, let's see. Let's see, one to three, four to six. Oh, then it's seven to nine. And then it's what, 10 to 20? Brian, is that what we, we can look at that? So now, if it's one to three, it's 100%, which means whatever the impasse it is, if it's four to six, it's 80%. And if it was from seven to 10, it would be 70%. And then I think, oh no, seven to nine is 70%. And 10 to probably 20 is going to be 60%. And I'm pretty sure that's correct. All right, let's go through some examples. Okay, if that's true, 10 to 20 is 50%. Oh, 10 to 20 is 50%. Ah, four to six is 80. Four to six is 80. Seven to nine is 70. You mean it goes from 70 to 50, Brian? If you're looking at your cookbook? Oh, okay. I didn't do many calculations where we had more than 10 conductors kind of bundled together. So now we have cables, we have Romec. For all practical purposes, all Romex cables are going to have two current carrying conductors. See, the rule that we're going to be talking about adjusting the impasse of a wire is because when you bundle a lot of conductors together, the, the concept is that then the heat that's being generated as the electrons are moving, it can't be dissipated as easily. So when you put more conductors, so when you're bundling cables, you're bundling conductors. So a two-wire piece of Romex has what? Hot and neutral. That's how many conductors that's carrying current? Two. A three-wire piece of Romex is going to have two hots and a neutral. The neutral conductor is never considered a current-carrying conductor, and that's still contained there in the 310.15 rules and, and in the 2020 code is about right in those similar rules right aside there. I, I can't get all the rules. But, so now, because the neutral is not current-carrying, so, but it is on a two-wire, but it's not on a three-wire. So that means three-wire counts as how many current-carrying? Two. Two wire counts is how many current carrying? Two. So now let's look at an example. He said, hey, I ran seven cables. Well, I know automatically I ran seven cables. Seven times two, that's automatically 14 wire. And that takes it into 10 to 20 range on the adjustment factor, which is 50%. Now, remember I said, when you go to table 310, 16, uh, 310, well, table 310, 16 and 20 code and a 310, 15, B16. Okay, so 310, 16 in the 20 code and table 310, 15, B16 in the 17 code. There's a 90 degree C column. We only use the 90 degree C column. The only time we use that is, well, there's two times. There is a 110, 14 C2 rule. I'm not gonna talk about it right now. And there is that rule about calculating the conductor opacity. So I have to figure the impasse of a conductor. Number one, first, you can read Article 100 definition. Read the definition of an impasse. That reminds me. You're watching this live. Guess what you got to do? You need to go back and watch this two more times. I'm talking really fast. I'm covering rules all over the place because I'm trying to give you as much as I possibly can. So just hear what I'm saying. Get a concept. Don't believe me. 
Never believe anything I have to say, please. Make sure you get your code book. Make sure you get your calculator. Make sure you confirm every single thing. I am going to say the wrong code reference because I'm kind of thinking ahead. And, and, I, and, and sometimes I might invert a number, you know, as I'm doing it. So watch this a second time because you're not going to catch it the first time. Some guys have been doing, doing a long time and, and no problem there. Back to our calculation. Seven type NM cables. Well, that's 14 wires, each containing two 12 gauge current carrying conductors. Okay, well then if I go to table 12 gauge wire, if you look at the 90 degree C column for 12 gauge wire, that's rated for 30 amps. 90 degree C, whatever you adjust the opacity, use the 90 degree C because we only use 90 degree C in the real world. Okay, back to the question. Seven conductors, seven cables, that's 14 conductors, containing 12 gauge wire, rated 30 amperes at 90 degree C, Going to be protected by a 20 amp breaker. Kind of makes sense. If you're in a 12 gauge wire, you're probably going to put a 20 amp breaker on that. Okay. So now, what's the ampacity after you apply the adjustment factor? So look back here. So 12 gauge wires rated for 30 amps at 90 degrees C on the code book table. The conductor adjustment is at 50%, and that's a table just a, a page or the other page opposite of the table. That's 50 percent because that was 14 conductors. You take the opacity of 12 gauge wire at 90 degrees C. You multiply it by 50 percent adjustment, and that gives you 15 amp wire. So can you put a 15 amp wire in a 20 amp breaker? 240.4 says conductors must be protected at their opacity. The answer is no. Now let's change it. Let's go with another example. Remember he said, the inspector said, hey, Mike, I can put no more than four in there. Well, if you put five, what's five times two? Ten conductors. That puts you at what percent? Fifty percent. Well, what happens if you have four cables? If you have four cables, that means there's what? Eight conductors, and that falls between the six to nine, which was at 70 percent. So looking at the calculation, 12 gauge wire is rated 30 amps at the 90 degree C. So highlight your 90 degree C column. That is only used for a conductor adjustment. Now, some people say, no, Mike, you got to use the 75 degree C. If it's over 100 amp years, you got to use the 60 degree C column under 100 amp years. 110.14C, one rules, have to do with size of the conductors within the enclosure. The wires that are outside of the enclosure, the factors that could impact them would be ambient temperature or the number of conductors that would be bundled, not the terminals. You have to size the wire no smaller than required by the terminals, but you got to be sure that the wire after adjustment and correction can be still protected by that circuit protection device. So go back to our graphic here. So we have four type NM cables, A conductors, each containing two 12, two 12 gauge current carrying conductors, 30 amp wire, protected by a 20 amp breaker, makes sense. So let's do the calculation. 12 gauge wire is rated for how many amps at 90 degrees C? 30, and that's what we use for adjustment purposes and correction. There's uh, eight conductors. Eight conductors is a 70% adjustment. So take your 30 amp wire times 70%. And that gives you an ampacity of 21 amperes. So that inspector was actually a pretty smart little cookie there. That guy knows exactly what he's doing. He already done the math. He, he, not the first rodeo. So now the contractor, he didn't know that. Obviously, he wouldn't be asking that question. Hopefully, I answered your question and you understand now. Large connectors for multiple NM cables. The question was this, Mike, I have a two inch connector. Can I just put a whole bunch of Romex connectors? I mean, Romex cables inside one big cable clamp? The answer is no. Cable clamps are actually listed. See, all fittings, 334.6 says, that's Romex, not metallic sheet cable, but that applies to all wiring methods. It says that all the fittings to be used with this wiring method has to be listed which means your connectors are going to be listed. And if you look at them, I've seen uh, cut sheets where they show a significant number of conductor, conductor cables, rather, significant number of cables actually installed in a connector. I was pretty surprised. Uh, I think Arlington 
has these really cool fittings that they probably plug in and then you bring in all these cables. They are specifically listed for a given size conductors cables and a given number of conductor cables. Another practice I personally have a problem with, but it's a violation of the code. You see, I think it's 300.15, no, 300. I think it's 12, talks about mechanical connection of wiring methods. See, Romex and EMT and Flex, they're supposed to be mechanically connected to the enclosures. You can see that in this case, they are mechanically connected, but they're just not connected with a fitting that's specifically identified for those number of conductors. I have seen people put a sleeve and then just pull all the Romex down a two inch sleeve. Personally, I think that's a great idea. I think, unless somebody gives me some reasons why it's not. Um, because you can add a cable to the, later on, you can pull out a cable, you don't have all these connectors inside there, but you are bundling the conductors together, you are bundling the cable together, and I'm like, please, am I dwelling in it? How many amps do you think any one of those cables are actually carrying? Has anybody ever seen a cable or a wire burn up because they were bundled together? But that's the matter. The code says this, mechanically, connect every single cable, every single raceway with a fitting specifically identified for its application. So no, you cannot have a big connector with a big clamp with the multiple cables. No, you cannot run a bunch of conductors and sleeved inside of a raceway. Oh, can you explain the grounding and bonding requirements for a transformer? No. No, I would take me four hours. There's a lot of different variables when it comes to transformers and grounding and bonding. Uh, and I'm not trying to sell you. And I'm just trying to say that if you're going to be a professional, I think it's pretty reasonable that you should be able to install a transformer, size the wires to the transformer, size the protects the transformer, make sure you ground it and bond it properly. I mean, I'm, I don't think I'm asking too much. You're supposed to be the expert. But unfortunately, I think too many people are depending on somebody else telling them something. And that wasn't my cult. To me, I had to know how to do it. And I had to have one. And I would have got, I would have, I invested in myself. I, mean, I didn't care how much it cost me. I don't care how, how much time I had to spend. I don't care how far I had to drive. I just wanted to take care of my baby and take care of my family. And that's all that mattered to me. So I won't be able to, in this short period of time, explain the grounding and bonding of transformers. Um, I'll tell you what I like to do. I want to go ahead and take, I don't need a break because if anybody knows me, they know I don't, I don't stop, but I want to go past an hour if that's okay with you guys. I know you have the choice that you can go ahead and just bail out whenever you want to. And I'm sure some people are like, ah, I don't need to know any of that stuff. I actually know everything. <laughs> Why would I need to listen to that guy? Cause I know every single thing there is to know. And if it changes, I don't need to know that. And I can appreciate that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a five minute break. Go get yourself a glass of water, finish up your coffee, get your code book out, get your highlighters, get up, get stretched. Because, you know, sitting here just watching a video can be just a little bit, you know, you might, I don't want you to start wandering away. So now Brian is going to be trying to consolidate some of the questions. And if you could on mycolt.com slash live right now, just kind of take the moment and give them some questions related to what I'm talking about. Okay. Okay. We're getting back to it. So this is a second day of, of trying this live my Colt at my house deal. And maybe do a little better today than we did yesterday. Maybe tomorrow we can even do better. So here are some questions that came up having to do with what we cover. And this one has to do with the transformer secondary conductor. Remember, 240-21C2 talks about the maximum secondary conductor length is 25 feet. Whether it's 25 feet or 10 feet, you are going to terminate into an equipment, a fusible disconnect that has fuses, or you're going to terminate into an, a circuit breaker. You cannot go to a main lug only panel ever. So there was a question in there about whether you can terminate to a disconnect. Well, you can terminate to a fusible disconnect because then you have to size the conductors to the rating of the fusible disconnect or, over, or an overcurrent device. So not to main lug only. And the question was, um, if you're running an equipment grounding conductor, in the raceway from the transformer to the panel, where do you land it? Well, 
The transformer has to have a ground bar in it. Your panel has to have a ground bar in it. How simple is that? Okay. You run a wire between the transformer and over to the panel, or rather not the panel. It could be a panel with a main breaker or wherever the secondary conductors terminate to. It's going to have to have an equipment grounding conductor terminal that's specifically listed for that specific piece of equipment. Okay. Um, by the way, you don't need a race. You don't need an equipment grounding conductor either on the primary or the secondary side. If you ran MC cable, because MC cable has its own equipment grounding conductor within the cable, or if you ran a metal raceway. So if you run a metal raceway with the raceway itself, 250.118 qualifies as your equipment grounding conductor. So if you're putting in flex, yes, you're going to be putting in equipment grounding conductor for all practical purposes, whether it be primary or whether it be secondary. Mm, Brian, what was the other one? Um, something as a ground, okay, the raceway. Yeah, can the raceway be used equipment ground? The answer is yes. Those that qualify in 250.118, which would be metal raceways. Okay, next one was like, hey Mike, that ground bar at the light pole, isn't it there for lightning? I know, that's the only place you could go to. And the answer is no. Watch, go to michael.com, go to videos, it's free. Go to bonding and grounding and watch that video and you are going to be cracking up the thought that anybody would ever think of driving a ground rod at a pole. Let me tell you what you don't do. You don't put ground rods at poles. You don't put ground rods at electric vehicle power stations. You don't, you don't put a ground rod anywhere. Or maybe I gave you a reference about grounding and bonding and I said, go over to that, that video again. That's where you put ground rods. The code will tell you exactly where you have to put a ground rod. Let me tell you where it's at. But not a ground rod, because it could be uh, a concrete encased electrode. In other words, it's going to be an electrode. Most people use ground rods at poles, though. Um, so you have to have a grounding electrode at a service, which, okay. You need to have a grounding electrode at a remote building. You're running a feeder to a remote building. You need to have a disconnect at remote building, and you need to have a grounding electrode there. And transformers, when you install transformers, you have to make sure that you ground that system as well as grounding the equipment at the transformer. Other than that, if you put a ground rod where it's not required by the code, that's called an auxiliary electrode. That means it's something that's extra. And 25054 covers auxiliary electrodes. And here's what they tell you to do. Nothing. Here's a rule that tells you. You don't have to bond that auxiliary electrode to anything else like you normally would on 250.50 for electrodes that are present. Number two, it doesn't have to have any kind of minimum resistance like 25 ohms for a ground rod. And number three, it doesn't matter what size conductor you run to that ground rod. So if you want to put a two foot ground rod at a metal pole and you want to, you want to run cat six wire to it, okay, who cares? It's not required by the code. It doesn't serve a purpose. So, nope. If you're putting a ground rod in that's next to something, it's not a service or a building disconnect, mm, like a generator or a grounding electrode, no, nah, more than likely, you're screwing it up. You're just doing it because you heard it. Okay? So, mycolt.com, go to videos, bonding and grounding, watch that video three times, and then you're like, oh my gosh, everybody in the world's crazy? They told me I was crazy when I tried to do this years ago. And I say, yep, everybody's crazy except Michael. And guess what? Now they understand why. All right. So, another question? The question is, why is bundling not a factor when you're bundling raceways 24 inches or less? I don't, can't even visualize where you'd bundle multiple raceways together. Brian, can you think of anybody? Oh, okay, the question was, oh, I'm sorry, the, about the nipples, you know, the raceway that's 24 inches. Why don't we have to adjust those conductors? Remember we talked about that adjustment on 310.15b in the 2020 code, um, and then 310.15b probably in the 17 code, has to do with the number of conductors at bundling. I talked about the number of cables, but if you're having conductors in a raceway, the rules still apply the same thing. You put in 10 conductors in a raceway, what's the adjustment factor? 50%. We kind of got that one worked out there. 
Um, but how come if the raceway is 24 inches or less, that there's, there's a rule in there that says that, well, you don't have to apply it to that. I don't know. Uh, maybe because the wire is so short and you have wires on the outside and, and they don't heat up. Uh, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. In other words, if you have a nipple of 24 inches or less, it doesn't matter how many wires you're running there that are current carrying, it's irrelevant because it only applies when you're bundling conductors more. Now watch this. Oh, another question is going to come up later on. We'll talk about that. I don't want to get into that. All right, looks like the break gave us some info, more information, and I'm going to go a little bit longer if that's okay with you guys. So we'll see how the feedback is. And, and give me some feedback on mycolt.com slash live because that's what I read. Unfortunately, I can't read the Instagram feed that's coming so quickly and, and other YouTube and, you know, and, and Facebook. I'm not going to read those, but I will read mycolt.com slash live, the comments on the bond. And I can tell me about the hour of the day. We're only going to do Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays from now on. Um, but start thinking about where you live and how it would impact you. Because next week, we're going to start at 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So you can do the math, how it works back to where you're at. Okay. Want right, another comment? Okay. Oh my gosh, the comment that comes in is like, Mike, some inspectors say you got to count the green wires a current carrying conductor. He probably hates aluminum wire. He probably hates GFCIs. I forget what they, I need to make up a list of all these, these uh, dinosaur guys, right? The Neanderthals. What person in the right mind would think an equipment grounding conductor is a current carrying conductor? See, 250.6 talks about the equipment grounding conductor and that it, it's only intended to be carrying current when there's a fault. And when you go to 310.15, it begins at the 20 and the 17 code made a big change in where they relocated these rules. You're going to have to kind of hunt in the 20 rules to find it, and you're going to have to hunt in the 17 rule to find that. And I don't have the time to be giving both rules simultaneously. It specifically says in the go book. Let's see if I can find them real quick. I don't have my tab. It specifically says that the equipment grounding conductor is not counted as an equipment grounding conductor. Let's see if I can find that quick enough. Here we go. And the 2020 code is 310.15F. A grounding or bonding conductor shall not be counted when applying the provisions of 310.15C1. Oh, I was saying uh, 310.15B. I'm sorry, it was 310.15C in the 20 code. What are you going to do? But you know what? Here's my experience. You get that code rule. You get your code book, 17 or 20. You find out where it's at. You show it to the inspector. I don't really care about that. If you want to get your inspection passed in my city, boy, you're going to count that green wire as a current carrying conductor. You have to ask him, what are your feelings about aluminum wire? And you're going to find what he says. I hate that aluminum wire. Are you kidding, boy? You know, you got all these Neanderthals. Those of you that are young, I'm sorry, you got to deal with all this crap of all these people. Hopefully you don't become like them and then you'll, you'll learn the code. You'll never say something. You should never ever argue code with anybody. If you can't find the code rule in your code book and you're going to sit there and argue with somebody, let me see if I watch this. You don't have a code book. He or she doesn't have a code book and you're going to sit there and argue about the code. Are you kidding me? That means you're already already becoming a Neanderthal because you're just making things up. All right, Brian, I guess that's all the questions that came in. Okay, calm in my ears like, hey, Mike, don't, in fact, don't forget there are some good inspectors out there. Hey, there's good electricians, contractors, inspectors, instructors, and everybody out, and there's a bunch of jerks out there. What are you going to do with jerks? You got to just live with it. There's nothing you can do. There's another... How you deal with people is how you have to deal with people. But here's the important thing. At least you should know the code, what the rule is. You try to work with the person, try to show it to them. More than likely, because men in particular are in power, which I'm sorry, ladies, okay? Um, they have an ego. So you can say, hey, listen, man, I understand, but could you just let this one pass? You got to try to help that person figure out how to get... If not, probably the next job he's going to go to, he's going to think twice about it, say, well, you know, all right, I'll put that in there, but I'll make that change, but 
I wish you knew the code a little bit better. So however you handle it, it's going to be a different story. All right. All right, ready to go? Next question, Brian. Here we go. Receptacle and lighting requirements. This one is just a, what's the requirements for electrical equipment in a dwelling unit? Lighting, power, receptacles, etc. I'm guessing this is somebody who's never worked, he's never done any kind of like residential wiring. Those of you that have done all commercial work, you get a set of blueprints and you go into a house, it's all framed out. I can guarantee you're like, what the heck is this? You know what I mean? Because it's like totally confused. So this question like, hey, what are the requirements for dwelling in a kitchen, light powers? That means somebody who's never done this or somebody's trying to design something. But you know what? Let's just do it a quick conversation to get you the rules. All right. First thing, 21052. Those that know me really, really well know how much I hate 21052. I mean, I hate this rule. If you get into the rule, go to 21052, A, B, C, D, and who knows, E, F, G, probably H or something like that. This is talking about receptacles and where you have to place receptacles. Many times it's pretty straightforward where you place a receptacle on the wall line or in the kitchen countertop. But there are just so many configurations in a building, in a house rather, in a dwelling unit, particularly in kitchen countertops, that it just becomes like, you know what, you tell me where you, here's what I was just saying. Tell me where you want the receptacle, Mr. Inspector or Miss Inspector, and that's where I'm going to put it. But if I'm doing residential work, I'm an expert at 21052. I mean, I'm an expert at 21052. I mean, you're doing residential work, and I, and I can see where there's flaws, and I can see where the code's not that clear. I might ask the inspector, what do you think? And whatever the inspector says, I'm like, cool. I'm going to do it just like yes, because it's kind of, it, it's kind of like, too many configurations. That's 52. 21070, and I'm not getting into the details of the graphics. I'm just kind of like getting us into the rule. 21070 talks about lighting outlets. Where do you have to put lighting outlets? Well, obviously you need receptacles in kitchens and you need lighting outlets in kitchens. And of course, 70 talks about a lot of different other locations where you need to put lighting outlets. So those of you that are doing residential work, I think you really should be an expert. I think you should know your code. As a matter of fact, I don't care what kind of work you're doing. Every single job that you're doing, every single fitting you're putting in, every single blueprint you're looking at, you should be able to go to the code book and verify the engineer. Oh, I, I check every raceway size, every conductor ampacity, every breaker size. You know why? It was giving me practice. It's helping me to understand. I was just an electrician, just trying to figure out how to get my journeyman's license. I knew if I got my journeyman's license, and I was told I would be making more money. Amen. That's all I wanted to do. Take care of my baby. Take care of my family. And so I got my journeyman's license. I studied. I spent money. I did effort. I did everything I could. And then I found out about a master's license. Then I got my master's license. Then I started learning about business. Then I started just keep. I always wanted to just invest in myself because that's the only way I could take care of my family. I might not spend a lot of money, a lot of other things, but I've definitely taken care of my family. That was my number one goal. So that takes care of lighting. Now, what else do you have to have in a dwelling in a kitchen? Well, don't have to have a stove. No, I'm gonna try to think this out. Nope, don't need to have a stove, electric. I don't need a dishwasher. Don't need disposal. Don't need a microwave. All I need is a countertop with some receptacles and if there's any wall space, some receptacles on the wall spot and a switch and a light. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Can you install a metal light pole within five feet horizontally of a swimming pool? Well, here's a picture. This is a metal light pole. Here's a luminaire. And, and of course, 680.22b1 tells us that luminaires and lighting outlets ins installed within five feet horizontally from a pool must be located not less than 12 feet above the water level. So any luminaire or lighting outlet, if it's within five feet, it's going to have to be 12 feet above the maximum water level. Look at the metal pole. 
the metal poles within five feet. Well, Mike, the luminaire, no. the code said the luminaire. If it was over 12 feet, if you're within five feet, you're okay. Okay, what's the luminaire? Well, this is the luminaire. Well, there you go, Mike. The pole's okay. Well, maybe not. If you go to Article 100 and you read the definition of a luminaire, it also includes whatever it takes to position the light. So go up on this pole that's, let's say, 14 feet. You have a light up there. How are you positioning the light? That would include the metal pole. So the metal pole is part of the definition of a luminaire. So since the pole is part of the luminaire and you can't have a luminaire within five feet of the water's edge of a pool, well then, code violation. Well, Mike, what if you put a wood pole, concrete pole, fiberglass pole? Well, then the luminaire is within five feet. Okay, got that but it's over 12 feet, got that? Yeah, but I thought you said what was holding that pole was part of the luminaire. Well, that, and I, you know, that doesn't really go anywhere. So you know what? Look at the bottom of the pole. Let's see if I can zoom in on that. Oops, go back here. Unfortunately, it's not as clear as I would like it to be, but that's a lighting outlet. And the code said this, Lighting outlets can't be within five feet of the edge of a pool unless it's located above 12 feet. Mike, what are you talking about? A lighting outlet? That's not a lighting outlet, it's a junction box. A lighting outlet, you know, you put like a, a box in a ceiling and then you put a plastering on there or maybe you get a box that's designed and you use 832 screws and you hang a luminaire to it. This is not an outlet box. Well. Not a lighting outlet, rather. Well, you got to go back to Article 100. It all comes to fundamentals. What's a lighting outlet? So you have to read the definition of a lighting outlet. I don't have time to get into all the language in there. And importantly, you have to read what is called an outlet. So read the definition of an outlet. Then read the definition, and that's under O. And a lighting outlet is under L. A lighting outlet, and it's the point where the luminaire receives its power. It doesn't have to be a box. So if you take a look at this pole, right there at that point is where that luminaire receives its power. If you want to say, well, I don't consider that pole to be a luminaire. I think the luminaire only applies, let's say, to the light fixture atop. Okay, fine. Well, then you still have a lighting outlet that's within five feet, and that'd be a code violation. Well, you know, Mike, I think you kind of like, it's almost like silly putty. You're kind of stretching this thing to fit however you want to stretch it. Okay. Let's assume that you read the definition of an outlet. You read the definition of a lighting outlet. And you just can't bring together that this is a violation because you don't think it's a lighting outlet. And you think the luminaire is above 12 feet. And so therefore you think it's okay. Okay, sometimes I say this, take a step back. Yesterday I explained this and I'll try to remind us again. Your job is to make sure that people are safe. We're not playing games with code rules that maybe the actual language of a luminaire and maybe when you get into 680, 22B, they really was not thinking about somebody putting in a metal pole, having the luminaire above 12 feet. Maybe they really never even considered that possibility or they never wrote the language to really tighten that up. And I will be submitting some public inputs, a public input on this to make it clear on the 23 code. But Mike, code says what it says. You gotta apply the way it apply. Listen, I don't want anybody getting killed. I don't think anybody watching this video think in any possible way a metal light pole within five feet of the pool, that has a juncture box, that has a light fixture up there, could possibly think. Now, the, the Neanderthal guy would be comfortable because you know why? He'd be driving a friggin' ground rod at the bottom of that pole. Are you kidding me? So if I was an inspector and you didn't like the way I interpret this rule, that I consider that metal pole to be part of a luminaire, so that's a violation, 
And if you put a if you put a wood pole there or a fiberglass pole or a concrete pole, I would consider that outlet box, and I really do consider that junction box a lighting outlet. You're not putting the junction box there. Now, you could say, okay, you know what I'm gonna do, Mike? Like I hear what you're saying. I'm gonna run wires from the panel, and I'm gonna run all the way up to the luminaire of a non-metallic pole, and I'm gonna connect it directly to the light. You know what I would tell you? Good for you. That was some pretty good thinking. Because you know why? I don't think anybody's gonna get killed. It's not a metal pole. So maybe you're thinking I'm kind of stretching here. I don't think I am. Definition of a luminaire. Definition of a lighting outlet. Definition of an outlet. The intent is to make sure that people are safe and that is your job. Not to play games with the words so that you can somehow save face because you put that pole in there. Sorry, you have to move that pole. We're not gonna allow you to kill anybody. So uh, the question was, does the voltage matter? That's a great question. Oh my gosh. Uh, if you go to low voltage, it's 411. I don't know the reference and I don't have a, you know, when I get questions off the top of it, I want to say it's somewhere maybe about 411. And Brian, if somebody gives you the, the feedback, you can tell me what it is. I think it's like somewhere like around, I don't know, I want to say 411.4, but maybe it's 411.9. That says that low voltage lighting cannot be within 10 feet of a swimming pool. So I don't know if they have low voltage lighting that's on a pole like this, but it really doesn't matter if it's low voltage lighting because 411 dot something says that we're going to level this body and not be within 10 feet. This is kind of crazy. You get the swimming pools, they say, hey, just stay five feet away. But if you get low voltage lighting, they say, hey, you have to stay 10 feet away. But they also make a reference in 411 dot, whatever that reference is on 680, that there is a provision that when you get into 680, it's Summarize. I think it's going to be 680.22, probably right in that same section there. It's going to say, you know what? If you have your low voltage lighting connected to a transformer that is specifically listed for landscape lighting with no distance away from the pool, then you're okay. And here's what the transformer is going to look like. It's going to say landscape lighting. And it's going to say pool lights. In other words, if you can get, it would have to be listed that way. You'll see it. It's, it's all printed right on the trans. It's what your, it's your normal 100 watt pool light or 300 watt pool light. And here's the logic. If you want to put a pool light transformer that converts 120 to around 12 volts, um, you can actually run that wire and you can put a light bulb inside the pool. Well, if you can, what is it for, was it? So 411.5B was a low voltage rule that referred us to price 680.22, somewhere in there. Oh, it just says 680. Okay, when you get to 680.22, it's an eight. Low voltage lighting can be within 10 feet, and then it tells you what it is. So you need to have a pool light transformer, mark landscape lighting, and think of the logic here. If you can get a pool light transformer and you can get the wires and run it into the swimming pool, inside the swimming pool, then clearly you can use that exact same transformer because it's a special transformer. Then you can use that exact same transformer for landscape lighting. So if you have a landscape lighting and you want that within 10 feet of a swimming pool, then you have to make sure you comply with that rule about using the pool light transformer application there. Okay? Uh, so, back to our graphic here. No, you're not putting a metal pole. I don't care how tall the light is within five feet of the swimming pool. I give all the rules on that. Grounding and bonding of services. Hey, Mike, can you explain the grounding and bonding of services? My question is about grounding and bonding at an electric service, specifically as it relates to the bonding of auxiliary wireways, main disconnects, enclosures, and raceways. When they, when, move that away. Let's get this out of the way here. Uh, when additional wire ground needed, size of them, bonding and bushings, etc. I can't move that to the next slide. 
course not. <laughs> that would take another four hours to explain the grounding and bonding of services. Do I think you as an electrician should be capable of going to an electric service of a building and knowing all the rules of grounding and bonding and bonding bushings and bonding jumpers and the sizing of the conductors to the service? Yeah, I think you should be doing that. If you don't know how to do that, then I would suggest two things. One, you need to learn how to do the calculations and calculate service. Oh, one second. On a residential service, go to go to the electrical toolbox, Mike, Mike Holt's electrical toolbox. It tells you how to size the service and the wires and everything like that. Not the bonding. Yeah, it actually probably tells you the bonding bushing also in there. But you need to get the bonding and grounding book. Get Don't buy a book of mine without getting the videos. It, that's just, it's almost like useless. Okay, you need to have the videos because you can see the interaction we're having here. Imagine if I had a panel of six people and I had the time and we had a program, then we would actually give you the, I would give you the absolute code rules that apply, but I'm working between two code rules that I'm covering text that's beyond what I'm covering specifically here. Here we go. Multi-wire branch circuit. I think this might be the last one. I think we're going to make this the last one. On a multi-wire branch circuit, which is two hops and a neutral, code requires a double pole breaker or a two pole breaker. Well, you can have a multi-wire branch circuit that's going to be three hots and a neutral. So then you'd have to have a three-pole breaker. So you need a, you know, two-pole. Let me phrase that. You need to be able to disconnect that multi-wire branch circuit in a couple ways. If it's a three-wire multi-wire branch circuit, you can use two single-pole breakers with handle ties. Or you can use a common trip two-pole breaker. If it's going to be four-wire multi-wire branch circuit, line one, line two, line three, and a neutral, three phase. Then you can use three single pole breakers with an identified handle tie, or you can use a three pole breaker. Okay, but we have to be able to disconnect that multi-wire branch circuit. And, it, it, and when you have a multi-wire branch circuit with three single pole breakers, the code does not require that if one phase faulted, that it would require you to open the other circuit breaker. Like if you have a square D breaker, if you have a little handle tie between those, if one breaker opens, well, the other breaker doesn't open, the single pole breaker. But if it comes with disconnect, you can close them and you can open them simultaneously, mechanically. But it doesn't have to be done in the event of a fault. Okay, so back to question. Isn't it true that if you have an open neutral of the two circuits, well, okay, the two circuits, some, I guess I didn't type it in there right, will find its own way to the next load putting 240 volts on the device? No. Fundamentals, electric theory, you have series circuits and parallel circuits and multi-wire branch circuits. We've covered that in fundamentals. That way, by the time you get to the code book, you know what the code rules are. Kind of yes, but not really. Good. All right, here we go. Here is a multi-wire branch circuit. And the code says this, and I've done it bottom. Each multi-wire branch circuit must have a means to simultaneously disconnect all phase conductors at the point where the branch circuit originates. That means, you know, just simultaneously disconnected, you know, just yeah, single pole, double pole, three pole, whatever it is, high tie. Okay, so that disconnects these two hot conductors, which is part of that multi-wire brain circuit. Okay. Now, let's take a look at the fundamentals that I had to cover my, in my theory book and explain this. Line one, line two, line one has a TV and, line, and it's 600 watts. Well, if you know what the TV wattage is, and you know what the rating of the circuit is, 600 watt load at 120 volts, you can figure out what R is. I think it's R is equal to E squared, E squared over P. So that would be 120 squared divided by 600 watts, and that would come out to be 24 ohms. Okay, beautiful. How about the hair dryer? So that's a hair dryer. The hair dryer would be 1200 watts rated at 120 volts. If I want to know what that resistance is, R is equal to E squared over P. E is going to be 120 squared divided by 1200 watts, and it's 12 ohms. So if we do some math here, if this is 600 watts and you divide it by 120 volts, you can figure out how many amps, right? So I is equal to E, no, I is equal to P over E, and your power is 600 watts. You divide it by 120 volts. What's 600 divided by 120? Can I use my phone that I'm talking, that I have my earbuds on to? 
because my wife, I'm using my wife's phone. Here we go. Clear it, 600 divided by 120. Oh, five amps. Why can I not see that? Should have seen that. Okay, what is that? It's five amps. That means the TV is drawing five amps. Okay, that's cool. Hair dryer. Well, okay, if it's 1200 watts and that was five amps, so 600 watts, you know, a little double that thing. That means that this is drawing five amps on the TV. The hair dryer is drawing 10 amps. That means that the neutral conductor itself is going to be the, the, the difference between the two, which is going to be five amps on the neutral. Okay, no problem there. So if we put an amp meter on here, and maybe on the graphics in the future, we could do that, Brian. We could show an amp meter five amps here. We could show an amp meter here, 10 amps. And we could put an amp meter on this neutral right here, and it's going to be five amps. Hopefully, you, you see how that works out. Okay, that's good. That's a multi-wire printing circuit. Everything is fine. What's the advantage of a multi-wire printing circuit? Well, we didn't have two neutrals. We had one neutral. And if you have two hots in one neutral, well, then that's just... Three wires. See, this is this is also called an Edison circuit. Those of you guys up in the Northeast, because Thomas Edison is, it, you know, he came up with a 125 volt circuit, and then Tesla comes out there with Westinghouse kicking his butt. Then he realized, oh my gosh! So they figured out, you know what? If we get another circuit at 120 volts and another circuit at 120 volts, use one common neutral, then what would happen is, imagine this: What if we had 10 amps on line one, 10 amps on line two? How many amps? Amps is on the neutral, zero. But what about if we had two circuits? 10 out on, on the hot, 10 amp on the neutral, 10 amps out, 10 amps on the neutral. Okay, well that's fine, Mike, watch, watch this. What's the voltage drop of that two wire circuit? Well, it's 10 amps plus voltage drop of the neutral. And it's 10 amps plus voltage drop of the neutral. What if it was a three wire circuit? 10, 10 and what? Zero. Guess what happened to the voltage drop for Edison? He dropped his voltage drop down by 50% because they only had one wire carrying current, not two wires carrying current, which means he could do what? He could run his circuits further away. And that's why it's called an Edison circuit. Today, not many people know that's called an Edison circuit. We have a multi-wire branch circuit. So what are the advantages of multi-wire branch circuit? Edison found out what? One re reduced conductor, 50% reduction and voltage drop, these are all positive things. But here's the danger, right? Everything in life is a trade-off. You gotta decide what you're gonna do, you gotta decide. So what happened was this. What happens if somebody, an electrician, goes into a panel in a building and they just take a neutral off the neutral bus and they notice this little spark? Hmm, interesting, little spark. And it's a multi-wire branch circuit. Well, as soon as you open up that neutral conductor, it's no longer a line one with a neutral and a line two with a neutral. It now becomes a series circuit. And those of you who covered fundamentals, whether you're taking my book or not, hopefully you understand fundamentals. And fundamentals says this on a series circuit. Number one, current remains the same. Guys, you better know your fundamentals. If you're in an apprenticeship class, you better know... Ohm's law, series circuits, parallel circuits, multi-wire effect, you better be an expert because I need you to know that when you start taking my courses. If you don't know that, you need to get my fundamentals, get up to speed so you can get back to where you should be so you can become the leader. Because one day, I'm going to be gone and all the other instructors, we're all going to be gone. We need you to do a better job than what we've done. So back here. So series circuits, you have what? Current remains the same. Also, voltage is distributed among all the resistors in the series circuit in accordance with the law of proportion. Let's go back over here. This is 24 ohms, the TV, and then the hair dryer is 12 ohms, which we did that calculation earlier. So this has twice the resistance of this resistor. Now there's other ways you can calculate this. That means that if you're taking 240 volts and you distribute it among all the resistors in the series circuit in proportion, well, 24 is twice the amount of 12. So therefore, that would be 160 volts on the TV. The hair dryer is 80 volts. Now, you could calculate this another way. We could know that 24 plus 12 is 36 ohms. So now you know the total resistance of the circuit. You know the voltage source is what? 240 volts. So if you know the voltage source, you know the total resistance of the circuit. 
you could then take what r uh, i is equal to e which is 240 over r which is 36 and it's going to give you a certain amount of current we brian we can even put an amp meter on that and show the current on that so now that you know the current and you know the resistance of the tv and you know the current which remains the same and you know the resistance of the hair dryer well then r then you then you can calculate both this e is equal to i which is the current of the circuit times r which is the resistance of the resistor we come out to be still 160 on the tv and 80 volts in a hair dryer so the danger and the hazard of multi-wire prime circuits is that electricians that don't understand the fundamentals of electricity could inadvertently take the neutral conductor out of a panel and of course wipe out all kinds of equipment i know one guy said mike we took we opened a neutral in the junction box in the ceiling of a best buy he says it wiped out ten thousand dollars worth of equipment we didn't know it was a multi-wire brand circuit i'm like what happened he goes mike the manager was my buddy they took all the equipment they put it back in the package of the box they brought other equipment back and he sent it back to different people talking about that it was lightning damage like, oh my gosh so my point is this multi-wire brand circuits Save a wire, save money, save labor, save raceway size, reduce voltage drop, all great things. The hazard is you open the neutral. Now, there's a law, by the way, it's called, I made it up for you. There's a law that's called Murphy's Law of a Multi-Wire Brand Circuit. And that law goes this way. The most expensive piece of equipment will always sacrifice itself to protect the least expensive piece of equipment. So... And, by, and there's another law. The damage in a multi-wire brain circuit, and I made this one up, the, the damage of any piece of equipment in a multi-wire brain circuit will be by the square of its value. So take a $2,500 flat screen, 4K, 8K TV, and then put it in, in a circuit that's supplying a toaster. The toaster is 12 bucks. The flat screen TV is $2,500. So take 12 squared, it's 144. Take the 2,500 square, which I don't know what the heck the number is. Well, you can see which of the two is going to get damaged the most, the most expensive piece of equipment. So back to the question. Let's go back to the question. On a multi-wire brand circuit, two hots and a neutral. Code requires a double pole breaker. Whatever, right? Two, three pole breaker. Isn't it true that if you have an open neutral of the two circuits, it will find a way to the next load, putting 240 volts on the device? Kind of yes. I mean, no, we're not putting 240 volts on any given device. It all depends on if you had a multi wire brain circuit, how many things are plugged in hot to neutral on this circuit, and how many things are plugged in hot to neutral on that circuit. When I was an electrician, I always did service work, and I, I just loved elderly people. That just, and I'm just a, like a character kind of guy. And I would go on a service call, and they would call me up, and they've been waiting for the guy to come in on his large complex to do service. So obviously, I'm later than than these people had wanted to that me come as i walk in the door they're all angry and agitated i'm like well, okay okay relax what's going on well what happens is i go into my kitchen and i turn my light my kitchen light doesn't come on and then my husband he goes and he turns on the tv and then the kitchen light comes on and the tv comes on but when he turns off the tv it turns off the kitchen light i'm like hmm. well what you gotta do is keep your tv on no and so they get all agitated so I, and i know what it's a multi-wire brand circuit. Now, you know what happens? Kind of like multi-wire brand circuit. What do you think happens when the electric utility loses their neutral on a service drop? Yeah. Some of the loads are gonna operate at uh, 80 volts. Some of the loads are gonna operate at 120 volts. And if you wonder whether the utility lost a neutral or not, it's real simple. Go to the service disconnect. Put your bolt meter on the case of the enclosure and go to line one and it better be about 122 or somewhere in there. And then you go to line two into the case of the enclosure. It better be about 122 and change, depending upon how old the neighborhood, whatever the case might be. But if you go to line one, it's 140. And you go to line two, it's 10. Guess what that means? That means you lost the neutral to that point. So you keep working your way backwards. And that's that's how multi-wire branch circuits operate. Now, of course, if you lose a neutral by the utility, and you call the utility and they wipe out all the equipment, Utility would tell you, we never lost a neutral. There was never a problem. I don't, we just happened to be out there in general maintenance. So it's highly unlikely when the utility loses a neutral that the customer is actually going to be able to get the utility to make a, 
any kind of cost. All right, guys, I ran you really late. Those of you guys are all the way to the East Coast, it's 1035. I know you got to get up early tomorrow, so some of you guys to do nothing. <laughs> so what I suggest you do is uh, go back in, on Facebook or Instagram. No, Instagram probably would have this also, but, you know, what is it? It'll be Facebook and YouTube. You can go back and you can watch those. Um, I'm going to wait a second if I could. I'm going to try to watch Instagram here. Mike wants to know what hour is good for all in Cali, 8 p.m. Eastern. Okay, so oh yeah, this is a good time for us to get some feedback here. So in California, guys, what's the best time you would want it in Eastern time? So everybody give me some feedback. I'm in New Mexico. I'm in uh, mountain time, so I'm not talking about me. So what's the best time, Eastern time, for those of you watching it? And Brian, is there any way, while I'm waiting for you to gather some questions here, is there any way to find out demographically where these people are looking at? In other words, in other words, there's no way to know how many from California and the different time zones. Now, okay, so we can't, we, we apparently can't, in other words, if there was two people watching California and there's a hundred people, let's say, in the ratio in the East Coast, guess what? We don't really care about you guys in California. I mean, that's just the way the math work. But if we have a lot more people on the West Coast than the East Coast, that I want to cater my time to be the best time for the most people. And I realize no matter what I do, we have three hours in time zones. And then of course those people, and I got people watching it from the Philippines. So those of you that can't make it, maybe can't make it live, you can kind of make it. All right. East Coast and Central. All right. So we got all these things. Okay. So, um, Brian, did we have anybody? By the way, I had Mario Valdez, who's, one, if you, I asked him how many times you watched my videos, he said at least 10, probably close to 15 times, over and over and over and over again. That's how you become great. And Mario is truly an amazing instructor, an amazing inspector, and, and, and actually a very good human being. That's, be, that's a joke between Mario and I. Um, so he's been helping me by consolidating the information, getting it to Brian, for Brian to give it to me. All right. Um, so thank you, Mario, for getting it to Brian. Brian, do you have anything else? Anybody's giving information? Yeah, we have enough questions here to do another whole entire session. Oh, guys, um, Instagram people. Sorry, but all the questions you're posting on Instagram will never be seen by me because I'm not going to go back and watch an hour and a half. And try to watch your questions. I, I try to see what you guys are saying and doing, but I'm trying to speak and I'm trying to make a presentation. So my cult, mycult.com slash live is primarily where I'm going to get your questions. Or you know what you can do? Send me a question to Mike at mycult.com. And that way I get it directly to me and then I kind of work together and put it together. Brian, are we done? Yeah, we're done. All right, boys and girls. I'll see you tomorrow night. Same time, same place. God bless. All right, Brian, you take that off. I'm still hanging with my, Insta my Instagram guys and ladies here.